Hello! Welcome to Something for Kids, Storytelling for the Young and the Young at Heart. My name is Father Steve DeMuth, Rector of Holy Trinity Church in Covina, and welcome to our storytelling time. I'm in a great mood tonight. Yesterday, I don't know if you noticed, but I was suffering from my spring allergies. Not mine, but what happens in spring often. We have seven different fruit trees in our backyard, and each are in bloom. And I was feeling miserable. And after a good night's sleep and a little uh, 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 allergy medication, I feel fantastic. Um, so thank you for putting up with me yesterday and we'll get off to a good start today. So I am so grateful to be here with you tonight, and I was curious how your day was. Uh, perhaps you can let us know what you did today. Uh, maybe if you did something interesting. Um, I'm finding it so great to learn what you're able to do during this time of stay at home orders and uh, how you're spending your day, how you're whiling away the hours. Remember, we are in the midst of a wonderful book, and it's just starting to get really exciting. It's a book by C.S. Lewis called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And we have gone from Lucy finding this beautiful country through the wardrobe to Edmund and Lucy going into the country, and now all four Pevensey children, the two oldest and the two youngest, are in this beautiful world. The last thing that happened yesterday before we stopped was that they met a beaver who could talk. And the beaver wanted them to come into the middle of the wood where she thought it was safer to speak when the trees were very close together and there wasn't even any snow on the ground. But before we start, I'm going to Remember to get my glasses out so I can see a little easier. And I don't know how I managed to do it, but there's always something to clean. And there you are. And where's my book? Oh my goodness. All right. So let's get right into it. We are in the chapter called A Day with the Beavers. Now get very comfortable. Maybe adjust your pillow. Sit comfortably. Uh, uh, perhaps you want something to drink. Uh, you can pause if you're watching on YouTube at Historic Holy Trinity Church of Covina. And you can pause it for a moment and get something from the kitchen. Um, if not, I'm glad you're here with us live as well. Now, I want to back up and say one thing. The beaver said in a low whisper, they say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And each of the children had a separate and different response to the name of Aslan. I wonder what it is about that name that made them feel so strongly in different ways. As we go along in the story, I wonder if you'll feel different about the name of Aslan as well. Shh, said the beaver, not here. I must bring you where we can have a real talk and also dinner. No one except Edmund felt any difficult about trusting the beaver now, and everyone, including Edmund, was very glad to hear the word dinner. They therefore all hurried along behind their new friend, who led them at a surprisingly quick pace, and always in the thickest part of the forest for over an hour. Everyone was feeling very tired and very hungry when suddenly the trees began to get thinner in front of them and the ground to fall steeply 
in front of them, down the hill. A minute later, they came out under the open sky, with the sun still shining, and found themselves looking down on a fine sight. They were standing on the edge of a steep, narrow valley, at the bottom of which ran, at least it would have been running if it hadn't been frozen, a fairly large river. Just below them, a dam had been built across this river, and when they saw it, everyone suddenly remembered that, of course, beavers are always making dams, and felt quite sure that Mrs. Beaver had made this one, or Mr. Beaver. They also noticed that he had a sort of modest expression on his face, the sort of look people have when you are visiting a garden they've made or, or reading a story that they've written. So, it was only common politeness when Susan said, What a lovely dam! And Mr. Beaver didn't say, Hush! this time, but merely a trifle, merely a trifle, and it isn't really finished. Above the dam, there was what ought to have been a deep pool, but was now, of course, a level floor of dark green ice. And below the dam, much lower down, was more ice. But instead of being smooth, this was all frozen into foamy and wavy shapes in which the water had been rushing along at the very moment when the frost came and where the water had been trickling over and spurting through the dam, there was now a glittering wall of icicles, as if the side of the dam had been covered all over with flowers and wreaths <coughs> and festoons of purest sugar. And out in the middle, and partly on top of the dam, was a funny little house, shaped rather like an enormous beehive and from a hole in the roof, smoke was going up, so that when you saw it, especially if you were hungry, you at once thought of cooking and became hungrier than you were before. That was what the others chiefly noticed, but Edmund noticed something else. A little lower down the river, there was another small river which came down another small valley to join it. And looking up the valley, Edmund could see two small hills. And he was almost sure they were the two hills which the white witch had pointed out to him when he had parted from her at the lamppost the other day. And when, and then between them, he thought, must be her palace, only a mile off or less, and he thought about Turkish delight and about being a king. And I wonder how Peter will like that, he asked himself, and horrible ideas came into his head. Here we are, Mr. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver, and it looks as if Mrs. Beaver is expecting us. I'll lead the way, but be careful don't slip. The top of the dam was wide enough to walk on, though not for humans a very nice place to walk, because it was covered with ice, and though the frozen pool was level with it, on one side there was a nasty drop to the lower river on the other. Along this route, Mr. Beaver led them in single file right out to the middle, where they could look a long way up the river and a long way down it. And when they had reached the middle, they were at the door of the house. Here we are, Mrs. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver. I've found them. Here are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And they all went in. The first thing Lucy noticed as she went in was a burring sound. And the first thing she saw was a kind-looking old she-beaver sitting in the corner with a thread in her mouth 
working busily at her sewing machine. And it was from it that the sound came. She stopped her work and got up as soon as the children came in. So you've come at last, she said, holding out both of her wrinkled old paws. At last, to think that I ever should live to see this day. The potatoes are boiling, and the kettle's singing, and I dare say, Mr. Beaver, you'll get us some fish. That I will, said Mr. Beaver, and he went out of the house. Peter went with him. And across the ice of the deep pool to where he had a little hole in the ice which he kept open every day with his hatchet. They took a pail with them. Mr. Beaver sat down quietly at the edge of the hole. He didn't seem to mind it being so chilly, looked hard into it, and then suddenly shot his paw in, and before you could say Jack Robinson, had whisked out a beautiful trout. Then he did it all over again until he had a fine catch of fish. Meanwhile, the girls were helping Mrs. Beaver to fill the kettle and lay the table and cut the bread and put the plates in the oven to heat and draw a huge jug of beer for Mr. Beaver from a barrel which stood in one corner of the house and to put on the frying pan and get the dripping hot. Lucy thought the beavers had a very smug little home that was not at all like Mr. Tumnus's cave. There were no books or pictures, and instead of beds, there were bunks, like on board ship, built into the wall. And there were hams and strings of onions hanging from the roof, and against the walls were gum boots and oil skins and hatchets and pairs of shears and spades and trowels and things for carrying mortar in, and fishing rods, and fishing nets, and sacks. And the cloth on the table, though very clean, was very rough. Just as the frying pan was nicely hissing, Peter and Mr. Beaver came in with a fish, which Mr. Beaver had already opened with his knife and cleaned out in the open air. You can think how good the new caught fish smelled while they were frying, and how the hungry children longed for them to be done, and how very much hungrier still they had become before Mrs. Beaver said, Now we're nearly ready. Susan drained the potatoes and then put them all back in an empty pot to dry on the side of the range, while Lucy was helping Mrs. Beaver to dish up the trout so that in a very few minutes, everyone was drawing up stools. It was all three-legged stools in the beaver's house, except for Mrs. Beaver's own special rocking chair beside the fire. And preparing to enjoy themselves, there was a jug of creamy milk for the children, Mr. Beaver stuck to beer, and a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table from which everyone took as much as he wanted to go with his potatoes, and all the children thought, and I agree with them, that there's nothing to beat good fresh water fish if you can eat it when it has been alive half an hour ago and has come out of its pen half a minute ago. And when they had finished the fish, Mrs. Beaver brought unexpectedly out of the oven a great and gloriously sticky marmalade roll, steaming hot, and at the same time moved the kettle onto the fire, so that when they had finished the marmalade roll, the tea was ready and to be poured out. And when each person had got his or her cup of tea, each person shoved his chair or her chair or stool so as to be able to lean against the wall and gave a long sigh of contentment. And now, said Mr. Beaver, pushing away his empty beer mug and pulling his cup of tea towards him, if you'll just wait till I've got my pipe lit up and nicely going, why now we can get to business. 
It's snowing again, he added, cocking his eye out the window. That's all the better, because it means we shan't have any visitors. And if anyone should have been trying to follow you, why, he won't find any tracks. That is the end of the chapter, A Day with the Beavers. Tomorrow night at 7.30, we will begin the chapter that says what happened after dinner. What we normally do at this time is take a moment to look over the day and ponder together what you might be thankful for, in a sense, to count your blessings. And I was wondering if you could let us know what you might be grateful for today. Today, I am grateful that my allergies are back under control and I'm not sneezing and my eyes aren't constantly watering today. And I'm also grateful for a very good night's sleep. What are you grateful for? While you're writing down some of your ideas, let's sing our song together. When I'm worried and I can sleep, I count my blessings instead of sheep. And I fall asleep, counting my blessings. When my bankroll is getting small, I think of when I had none at all. And I fall asleep, counting my blessings. I think about a nursery and I think of curly heads. And one by one I see them as they slumber in beds. If you're worried and you can't sleep, just count your blessings instead of sheep and you'll fall asleep counting your blessings we have a lot of blessings don't we all right that's all the time we have for today thank you so much for tuning in and being with us May you have a good night's rest counting your blessings. God bless and good night.